Hi, awesome to see you. Great to see a packed room. My apologies for people in the front. You're going to have like neck pain at the end of this talk from watching up. And the people at the back, well, I'm not sure about heights, but it seems pretty crazy to be up there. All right, we're going to talk about, well, OAuth 2.0, OAuth 2.1. I'm going to start by asking you a question. If I stand back here, by the way, I can see you without the lights in my eyes. So uh, who here is using OAuth 2.0? Show hands, like almost everybody. Kind of makes sense if you're here. Uh, who's using OAuth 2.1? Like nobody. It's like, what the hell are you talking about? What's the OAuth 2.1? Well, that's why you're here, I'm kind of guessing. And I'm going to talk about um, OAuth 2.0 today. But before you try <laughs> start throwing things at me, hear me out. I'm not going to mess up your time. I'm going to be uh, speaking about OAuth 2.0 security best practices or best practices in general. And th the story goes as follows. This is from 2012, the original OAuth specification built in a completely different time. 2012 is 10 years ago. That's actually October 2012, so it's almost um, on the dot, like a couple of days missing. But this is literally from a decade ago. And you can imagine a decade ago, web applications looked quite different. And today, Web applications have evolved, and we've learned a lot about how attackers operate and what may have not been the best choices back in 2012, or that they haven't preserved their uh, benefits today, and things have changed over time. And over time, we've gotten all these additions to the OAuth specification. There have been addendums and security best practices, and oh yeah, mobile apps probably do something special as well, and for front-end web apps, we, we kind of have separate rules, and all of, them, all of a sudden, we have this whole suite of specifications. And if you are a new developer, if you're trying to get into OAuth today, it's a mess. Basically, you start with a spec from 2012, and you read it, and you're like, OK, I probably did not really get that, but sure, let's, let's continue. And you're going to dive into the other specs, and it's like, oh, but this spec says that that is no longer valid from the original spec. And in essence, you have this whole messy ecosystem, and you need to read about five, six specifications to get a current idea of what you're supposed to do today. And even then, it's not that clear. And that's something that a lot of people struggle with. So what happened is that the working group decided, like, yeah, this is probably not the best way of doing things, and the old spec is kind of not great anymore, so let's build a new one. Well, not a new one, but let's consolidate current best practices in OAuth 2.1. So let's just take the original spec, remove everything that is deprecated that you shouldn't be doing anymore, add in everything that we learned in the meantime, like, yeah, this is something you should be doing, and start adding it on top of that. And that became OAuth 2.1, and OAuth 2.1 does not exist yet. So this talk, um, I'm, I'm going to keep having, have, having to update this over time, because this is a draft document, as in this active, ongoing work. Um, the direction of where it's going is fairly clear, fairly straightforward, which is why I am talking about it. But in the end, the draft is not finished yet. Uh, there might be some changes along the way, but I'll keep updating this session as I give it uh, in other occasions. So that's essentially the setup for today. What am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about OAuth, best practices. I'm going to talk about some things that do change in 2.1. And by the end of this session, you'll have a, a definitely a good idea of what you're supposed to be doing today, which are OAuth 2.0 best practices. And if you're doing that, you'll be ready for OAuth 2.1 when it comes out. Now, there's a side note here. It also means that new features that have been added that are really, really great aren't really backported to OAuth 2.1 because the, the, the people behind the spec want to preserve some form of backwards compatibility, as in they don't want to start forcing you, if you're doing current best practices today, that you also have to do this and this and this and this, even though um, you probably want to. Uh, they, they're not going to enforce that. So OAuth 2.1 will live together with additional expansions that further improve the security of OAuth flows, uh, if you prefer to. All right, that's a short introduction. So what are we not going to talk about? We're not going to talk about OpenID Connect. So OpenID Connect is about user authentication. So whenever you end up on my website, I'm going to use Zoom as an example because, well, since about two years, everybody in the world knows and uses Zoom, whether you like it or not. So uh, wh why not? So when you arrive at Zoom, you're going to have the authentication uh, dialog, which is OIDC. You have like federation at the bottom, social login, enterprise login, all of that stuff is OpenID Connect. It's built on top of OAuth. It uses the same concepts as OAuth, but I'm not going to dive into the details of that. So if you want to represent this schematically, what we have here is we have a bunch of clients asking for user authentication. That's OpenID Connect, and that is out of scope. So forget about OpenID Connect. We mentioned it, um, and we don't have to do it for the rest of this session. What are we going to talk about? We are going to talk about OAuth. 
And all that comes into play when, again, Zoom, if you schedule a meeting on Zoom, you can say, like, add this to my Google Calendar account, and Zoom is going to take the user to Google, ask, where Google is going to ask, like, are you sure you want that? Do you want to give Zoom permission to your calendar, yes or no? And I talked about this in a workshop before, and a lot of people were like, uh, no, I don't, and they would click the cancel dialog. But that's OAuth, essentially. Main use case of OAuth, asking access on behalf of a user. Zoom asking Google, I would like to access the calendar API on behalf of who the user is. Philip in this case, which Zoom doesn't have to know. And that's OAuth. Can I access the API? The question to the authorization server, that's a client asking access, using an access token to contact APIs, uh, to make API calls. And then we have the APIs making decisions used on based on these access tokens with very implicit relationships or explicit relationships with the authorization server. That's OAuth. And that's essentially going to be the focus for this session here today. We're going to talk about best practices that you should be doing, some limitations also in the OAuth specs, and some guidance on how to improve that further. All right. With that out of the way, let me quickly introduce myself. I'm Philippe de Rijk. I'm from Belgium. And I've been at NDC, uh, the various NDC conferences, for a couple of years now. And it's absolutely awesome. And it's great to see so many of you back here today. My main thing is I run my own company called Pragmatic Web Security, and I help developers build more secure software. Ma only, mainly through training and conference workshops, like in-house training, conference workshops on security, API security, front-end security, OAuth, OIDC, topics like that. And also through like, highly specialized consulting on difficult security topics. I'm a Google developer expert and an Altzero ambassador, which are kind of outreach recognitions from these companies. So I don't work for Google or Altzero. They just um, like what I'm doing, and they want to send me free t-shirts every now and then if I mention that I'm a Google developer expert or an Alt Zero ambassador. So that's, that's a relationship there. And I also organized something in Belgium called SecOpDev, a week-long course on security. If you're interested in that, check it out um, online. But enough about me. Let's talk about OAuth. So what's there in OAuth 2.0, OAuth 2.1? Well, let's start with the flow that makes things fairly easy. Let's start with a client credentials flow. So what are we doing here? We're basically trying to access an API. I'm going to use a restaurant review app as my training application called Restograde. Why? Because I like food, I like good restaurants, and well, this kind of mixes uh, security with my, uh, my hobby, which is nice food. <laughs> so um, that kind of makes sense. Restaurant review app, everybody knows how that works. Easy conceptually. And in this case, we have a client application trying to access some information on that um, restaurant review API directly. That client application wants to get a list of or statistics from the application. Like how many reviews have been created yesterday across how many restaurants so that the client can use that for God knows what reason. This is essentially direct access to an API as a client application. It's not really on behalf of a user. It's just like, hey, give me something from a non-public API endpoint, as in we need some authorization in place to access that endpoint. All right, this service here that we have at the bottom, that is your OAuth client application. And to get started, you have to register that client. That's kind of a requirement in OAuth. Well, actually, the spec says you can also do it in different ways, but we're not going to talk about that. Literally, in the spec, like, that's your problem, not ours. But in this case, the client will be registered, meaning the client has an identifier in the OAuth ecosystem and probably also has credentials or some uh, secret. Can be key-based authentication, can be client ID, client secret, uh, much like a password. Doesn't matter much what you're using, uh, OAuth 2.1 supports various mechanisms. All right, APIs are also typically defined at the authorization server, so there's some notion of what an API is, how that exactly works, very much depends on your implementation. So for example, Auth0 is gonna use like very specific identifiers for APIs, uh, other systems are much more implicit about that, use a mechanism like scopes to differentiate between APIs, but that doesn't matter too much for what we're gonna talk about here. All right, so once we have our client, we have an API, we can ask for an access token. So how does that work? Well, the client goes to the authorization server using client credentials and says like, hey, I'm this client, here's my client ID and secret, or here's something I signed to show you that I'm the real client. Can I get an access token for the API, please? Authorization server verifies that, comes back, well, yeah, here's an access token, and the client can now access that API with the access token. This is the client credentials flow as we've always known it. Um, that's still a current best practice. That is a flow that has survived from that original 2012 spec up to today. And it's used quite often for machine to machine access, API to API communication, and so on. So this is a quite common pattern and an integral part of the OAuth spec. All right. I know most of you are developers. 
So if you look at pretty PowerPoint slides, you get kind of angry, you want to see monospace fun. So here you go. Uh, a request like this would look as follows. We have a call to the token endpoint um, on the authorization server. We have a grant type client credentials, just as before. We have the client exchanging um, a client ID here. We have the client uh, authentication properties, the client secret. And we have, in this case, an audience. That's an odd zero specific um, thing because this is a request from my demo scenario with out a zero. I use that for my trainings. Best practice, client credentials grant from machine to machine access. That's one of the first takeaways for this session. That one is still today a current best practice. That's something that you definitely want to use uh, in your OAuth architecture. All right, still present in the OAuth 2.1 spec as well. Good, step number one. What else do we have? Well. Most use cases rely on some user-based access, a client accessing a resource on behalf of a user. For that use case, we still have our restaurant review application on the right, and we now have a client that allows you to schedule reviews. I'm going to use somebody from the audience as an example. Like you here up front, you seem like you enjoy good restaurants, right? And you kind of look like an influencer. So you might want to be like, I want to post my reviews at the best optimal time, not at 9 a.m. in the morning, because nobody cares about going to a restaurant at 9 a.m. You're still dealing with the alcohol from the night before when you went out. So, But about 5 p.m. in the evening, that's, that's a perfect time. So you want to use a tool like this to schedule your reviews. So they come out at 5 p.m., perfect time. Everybody starts looking like, where are we going to eat tonight? Like, ooh, that's a great place. And that's how you optimize your influence, basically. I do the same for scheduling tweets about slides and conference talks, so I don't live tweet that often. In this case, it's an application trying to act on behalf of a user. It's an application that will go to the API at some point in time and say like, hey, I want to post this review in the name of this particular user. User-based access. How do we set that up? Well, again, you register that client application. It's a backend web app. In this case, a backend web app, you register that with your authorization server. And when you do that, you'll have to enter a couple of interesting values, such as a redirect URI, the callback. You have to specify when my interaction, which I'll show you in a second, my interaction is done, I expect a callback at this particular endpoint, meaning that you'll get a request at that endpoint, you get some information, an authorization code, uh, which we'll talk about in a second. At that endpoint, you can use that to continue the flow with specific steps. And you have to register that value upfront for security purposes. Otherwise, an attacker could come in and be like, when you're done, just send it to evil.com, and uh, you're, you're, good to, you're good with that. And that's not possible because of this registration step. Now, this is where OAuth 2.1 kicks in. As in, OAuth 2.0 was like, yeah, you have to register this, um, redirect your eye, it's important, but you're, you're kind of free to do that however you want. And a lot of people started using wildcards or partial matching and stuff like that, which resulted in potential security bypasses. And that's essentially why they said in OAuth 2.1 and in OAuth 2.0 security best practices, like, yeah, let's not do that anymore. We use exact URI matching for the callback. Like, if you want multiple, you can have multiple. You can provide a list of callbacks, but it has to be an exact match, not a partial match, not a uh, wild card. Uh, these things should not be used um, anymore these days. All right, that's the setup. Once our client is configured, how do we progress? Well, we run a flow, and that's where things get What's the word? Um, more difficult because the user is involved, but the, the correct term would be interesting. That's where things get interesting. Because now we involve a browser of the user, right? So the user starts some interaction with that application, connects to my RestoGrade, my Restaurant Review application, connect to that account, so you have option, the option to post a review in my name. And the, uh, the, the flow starts, so the backend application initiates a flow which will basically redirect the browser of the user to the authorization server. And that's where a lot of uh, messy parts come in, and the URL to do that looks exactly like the one you see here, or that's one example of what it looks like. It's a redirect, including all the information about how the flow should be run. For example, on line, uh, line number two, you get a response type. What do we expect as a response? A code, an authorization code. And who are we? We are this particular client, the, the scheduler client that is trying to get a token. And when you're done, you should send that authorization code as a response to this URL, the callback. That's the URL that has been registered up front, and it has to be an exact match uh, when this is executed. That's step number two. The browser is very obedient. The browser is like, oh, we're redirect. I'm going to follow that. And the browser will go to that authorization server. 
Now, if the browser has an active session, this is where the browser would send a cookie along with that request and the authorization server would know who you are. It's like, oh yeah, this is Philippe from 10 minutes ago, fine. And you don't have to authenticate. If there's no active session, then there will be authentication on that step. The, the authorization server will be like, who, who are you and what, what are you trying to do? And that's an authorization step. There's optional consent as well. Like, are you sure you want to give this application access to that API on your behalf? Like Zoom asked, or Google asked for Zoom, something like that. That's essentially what happens in that user interaction. If you've been using OAuth, you're probably familiar with that step as well. When that is done, we get the authorization code as a response, which is returned to that callback URI back with a redirect through the browser, and it ends up on that backend application, which now gets an invocation, a get request. It can retrieve that authorization code from the URL. That one is listed right here. You see how that works. The callback is called, the listed callback from before with that authorization code that can be extracted from the URL and now ends up on the backend application. So what do we do next? We do an, a code exchange. We have to exchange that authorization code for tokens with the authorization server. So our application, our scheduling app, goes back to the authorization server, server-to-server -server communication, and it's like, yeah, I would like to exchange this code for tokens uh, so I can actually do something useful on behalf of the user. That step requires authentication. It's a backend app. That step is protected with authentication to avoid abuse in case somebody intercepts that authorization code one way or another. Very important uh, security property here in this flow. Request looks like this. It's again to the token endpoint. We are exchanging an authorization code. We are this particular client. He, we received the code on this particular URL, and here's that code that we received. Fairly straightforward standard OAuth stuff. And if everything checks out, the authorization server will give you that response. Here's the response with an access token and a refresh token. And now that scheduling client can access the API on your behalf, post that review that you wanted to post, and take it there. That's essentially how the authorization code flow works. The authorization code flow from 2012. The authorization code flow from 2012 that is no longer valid today in that form. As in, OA 2.1 says like every authorization code flow today requires the use of Pixie. Which brings us to the question, what is Pixie? Or something more explicit that I'm not going to say out loud here. But <laughs> what is Pixie? Pixie means proof key for code exchange. Which, of course, prompts the response like, ah, what? That's a very complicated name for what Pixie actually is. And the goal of Pixie, I'm going to explain that next because it is a best practice today. The goal of Pixie is to tie the start of a flow, the initialization of a flow, to the exchange of the code, to avoid somebody messing with the integrity of those steps, to ensure that these steps happen in the correct context and that they are associated together. And we're going to do that using a hash function. And here's how that works. So the, the steps, I'm going to highlight what changes uh, in green. So the steps, the user still does what they want to do, connect my account. And then the client application is going to calculate a r long random value, like really long, at least 43 random characters, like really long. And it's going to keep that value secret. It's going to be like, ha, I'm going to store that value associated with this user. So I know who the user is. I'm going to store this value for now. And then it's going to calculate the hash value of that random string, like a hash. You feed it through a hash, and you get like a unique value associated with the input. But you can't reverse a hash. That's a property of hashes. You can't reverse them. So if I tell you a long hash value, you can't tell me what the input was. You can try to guess, but you'll, you'll have to literally try and recalculate the hash to see if it matches. There's no way to go back. And we call the secret value, we call that a code verifier. And the hash of that, we call that a code challenge. And we're going to send that hash to the authorization server in the flow in step four and five here. So we're basically telling the authorization server, in the start, we know something. And we're going to give you proof that we know it, because we calculated something on this value, but we're not telling you what the secret value is. We're just giving you the proof. And the authorization server will keep track of that value alongside with the authorization code that was created. So the authorization server now has an authorization code. And that hash, like somebody had a secret, I don't know what it was, but we'll see, we'll see. And the client receives that authorization code just like before and exchanges that authorization code for tokens with credentials. And at that moment, in step 10 here, we include our code verifier, our secret. The client says like, you know, in the beginning I told you I had a secret for this specific interaction. Well, here's that secret. 
Here's proof that I'm really the one that started this in the beginning. Here's proof that nobody else is messing with this, that the integrity is preserved, because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to tell you this very long random string right now in step 10. And that's essentially what happens, and the authorization server will be like, we'll see about that. And it rehashes that value, and it compares the hash to the stored hash, and if everything matches, then awesome, this is valid, and you get your tokens, and you are a happy client because you can access the API. And that is essentially a best practice today for every authorization code flow, the use of Pixie, proof key for code exchange. All right. The whole purpose was to, to associate the initialization in step four here with the finalization of the flow in step 10 with the code exchange. That's the goal of Pixie, and that is a current best practice in OAuth security best practices and in OAuth 2.1 as well. All right. Awesome. What about front-end web applications. Well, if you ever read the original spec in 2012, you will have read that front-end web applications use the implicit grant. And then things changed, web applications developed, we got more advanced in how we built them, more capabilities in the browser, we were easy to easily make API calls across origins and so on. And today, the best practice for front-end web applications is to use the authorization code flow. That is something that changed in March 2020, if I'm not mistaken. And that kind of caused some shockwaves through the community because all of a sudden, your implicit flow was deprecated and you use the authorization code flow for front-ends, with Pixie, by the way. How does that change? Well, if you had the original back-end flow, we had that step 10, which required client credentials. Well, guess what? You can't put client credentials in a front-end JavaScript app because evil hackers will just open your JavaScript files and be like, oh, that's your secret, or this or that, and they just extract it and abuse it. And that's not very good. So that step, it does not require client credentials. It cannot require client credentials. A front-end web app is what we call a public client, meaning it has no authentication which may result in some issues down the line, but we'll talk about that in a bit. So this step is not authenticated, and all of the security relies on that redirect URI. That URI that you register up front, like when you're done, you send the authorization code to this endpoint in step nine. This endpoint is now a front-end web page that is being loaded, and the security relies on the attacker not being able to intercept that. Because if you want to change that to evil.com, the authorization server is like, no, you're not allowed to do that. I'm only sending it back to app.restricate.com slash something something. Well, first single page, apps index.html is a something something. And then JavaScript will boot up or load, will re 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 retrieve or read that value from the URL, exchange it for tokens um, with that authorization server, and hopefully everything works out. That's essentially how front ends work. Current best practice today, awesome. Awesome, why? Because when I talk about OAuth these days, I don't have to talk about a whole bunch of flows. It's like, yeah, authorization code flow with Pixie. Done. You're probably thinking, that's all great, but I'm a mobile developer. Like, I don't care about web apps. Well, first of all, if you're a mobile developer, your life is probably a lot easier than if you're a front-end web developer. But that aside, how does this work in mobile apps? Well. Here's the scenario for front-end web apps. I'm going to highlight the changes for mobile apps. Pay close attention. That's it. It's the authorization code flow with Pixie. So seriously, my life building slides is hard. It's like copy the slide, right-click the image, change picture with, bam, new image, and we're done. That's it. I don't even have to draw these because my wife does that for me. So that's awesome. <laughs> awesome as well. She has no idea what it means, though, but I'm just saying, like, I need this icon. It's like, okay, I'll make it happen. And that's pretty cool. Seriously, mobile applications use the authorization code flow with Pixie. Have been for a while, by the way. I think, I don't know the exact date, but it's like six, six ish years that they are supposed to do that. And Pixie was originally invented for this flow with mobile apps because of uh, potential app based re, uh, interceptions. Like a malicious app could intercept the authorization code in step nine, and because of that, exchange it. And with Pixie, that's no longer possible. And then they saw like, hey, this Pixie thing is actually pretty awesome, and it protects against a couple of weird attacks, like uh, code injections, and that's why they uh, require that for every flow as well. Now, a side note for mobile apps. In mobile apps, there's some interaction with a browser, and this may seem weird. You are supposed to do this in a browser in mobile apps. So the, the OAuth specs actually say that you're supposed to use a system browser, not a web view, because web views are insecure. As in, if you're a mobile app and you embed a web view in your app, you can actually reach into the web view, uh, log keystrokes, um, 
execute additional code, do whatever you want, basically. So that's not a best practice. What you're supposed to do is use uh, the system browser, which is on iOS an SF Safari view controller, if I'm not mistaken, and on Android a Chrome custom tabs. And there you can integrate the system browser, style it a bit so you can style whatever is around that, but you can't access the internals of the page. And that is the recommended best practice. Gives you benefits as well, because that system browser has access to existing sessions. It's basically just your normal OS's browser, but just in an embedded format. If you have an active session with Google, for example, you will be able to reuse that session uh, for single sign-on across mobile apps, uh, things like that. Absolutely highly recommended to do that. And that is the best practice for mobile applications. We use the embedded system browser to run an OAuth authorization code flow with Pixie. I also know that some of you are building mobile apps. You're like, yeah, this browser-based thing, usually it's like marketing doesn't like it because it disrupts the user experience and they want this native login form and we just capture credentials and we do some weird stuff with credentials by sending them directly to the authorization server. That is never or nowhere recommended by OAuth. That's a violation of the OAuth specs. Yes, a lot of people are doing it. Yes, a lot of vendors support it for exactly those reasons, but no, it's not legitimate OAuth and it's not recommended. One of the downsides of doing that is that you're teaching users to just enter credentials whenever an app asks it. So whenever a mobile app is like, yeah, just give me your Google credentials, it's like, what? No, of course not. So that's a bit of a problem. There are cases where this does make sense, but it's not, just know it's not recommended OAuth, and please don't call it OAuth because it really, really isn't. All right. That brings us to an overview of OAuth flows. In the original spec, you found the authorization code grant. They're not called flows, they're called grants. I don't know why. You have the implicit grant, you have the resource owner password credentials grant, and you have the client credentials grant. That's what the OAuth spec in 2012 proposed, and each of these had a very specific use case in mind. And here's how it translates into modern current best practices, OAuth 2.1 basically, if you want to call it that. The authorization code grant is still there. Every user-facing application is supposed to use it, but you have to augment it with Pixie. That is how it changed. You have to use Pixie when you want to be compliant with current best practices. All right. Implicit grant is deprecated. Out. No longer valid. Don't use it. If you're using it, my advice is um, it's not really more broken than it was two, three years ago. Um, so it's just there's a better option, the authorization code flow. So my advice is start phasing it out. As in put it on a roadmap like, yeah, we probably want to replace this with the authorization code flow. It's going to work in a very similar way, and libraries all have support for that, so it shouldn't be that difficult. All right. It's not something that means you have to stand up now and run out to fix your applications and change the implicit grant, but it's something you should think about doing in the next, let's say, couple of months, which I say every time I give this talk, so uh, <laughs> you have some leeway there, so uh, whatever. Then the resource owner password credentials grant, that was kind of an abomination in the spec with good intentions, and then people are like, yeah, let's abuse that thing. So that one got deprecated like really fast, um, like a year or a couple of years after the original spec, so you shouldn't be using that one. And then the client credentials grant, that's actually preserved in 2.1. That's the only flow that uh, made it through the whole decade without needing modifications. It's also the only flow that just like send a request, get a response, done. Kind of plays a role here, I guess, but that's how things work in practice. Awesome. Don't run away yet, there's more to come. Because there's like a side flow, a supporting flow, the refresh token flow. Because you can get refresh tokens, and refresh tokens allow you to get a new access token from the authorization server in case you need one. And the refresh token flow originally was only available for backend web applications that could authenticate as a client, and things were fairly straightforward, and no complications, and everybody was happy and awesome. And then. Things change because now front-end web applications can also run a refresh token flow because they run an authorization code flow with Pixie. They can get a refresh token and they can run a refresh token flow and that one requires some changes. And that brings us to this part of the presentation. What's the problem here? Well, with a backend application, you had authentication on the request to exchange a refresh token for a new access token. Good. Front-end web apps, no secret. Meaning... No authentication, meaning refresh tokens in front-end web apps have become bearer tokens. And the properties of a bearer token are, 
if you are the holder of the token, you have the authority to use it. Meaning, if you can steal a refresh token from a front-end web app, well, guess what? You now have it, so you now have the authority to use it, evil or not. That's what a bear token means, and that's exactly what the problem is here in this flow. So you use a refresh token to get a new access token, so you can get access the API, skipping through a couple of steps here. And OAuth 2.1, or the OAuth uh, best practices for browser-based apps, say like, yeah, these refresh tokens as bear tokens are not ideal, so we have to use a concept uh, called refresh token rotation. So refresh tokens enable short-lived access tokens, good, but these are bear tokens. And bear tokens means they're really vulnerable, and because of that, the specs say you need to use refresh token rotation. Which means, you can see this in the image right here, let's see if I can highlight that. Um, and see here, we use a refresh token, and we get a new refresh token when we get a response. And that refresh token, that new refresh token, that's something you have to use the next time, and the next time. And that's what refresh token rotation is. All right, How does that, what does that look like on a timeline? Here's a timeline from left to right, like old to new. You kind of get how this works, right? And the application obtains tokens, access token one and refresh token one. And let's say that access token one is valid for 10 minutes, which is a good practice, by the way. If you can do that, awesome. That means that after 10 minutes, access token one is going to expire, and the app will no longer have access to the API. But we have a refresh token. And that means that after nine minutes, we can go to the, to the authorization server and be like, hey, we have a refresh token. We would like a new access token. And the authorization server will verify everything, like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Here's a new access token, AT2. And by the way, here's a new refresh token, RT2, for next time you come around. And again, the access token is solid for 10 minutes, so we do the dance again. And in nine minutes, we use RT2 to get access token 3 and refresh token 3. And then we do it for 4, and so on, and so on. And you, you kind of see how this works in practice, right? That's refresh token rotation. That's mandatory for bearer refresh tokens. All right. Now, how does this make things better? Well, it's because there's a second step in this whole process, and that second step comes into play when a refresh token is reused. Because you're not supposed to use a refresh token twice. You're always supposed to use the new one. And the scenario looks as follows. So the app has legitimate refresh tokens until, at some point, the attacker compromises the front-end app. I'm going to use an attacker here. So um, Anders. He's uh, up front here. Anders is uh, essentially our attacker. He breaks into an application. He, through cross-site scripting, for example, he steals a refresh token from the app and ships it off to a server somewhere, and he can now abuse that token. He can use that token to essentially obtain fresh access tokens from the SDS. That's a malicious uh, behavior here, and the attacker is doing that in practice, meaning that the attacker has access tokens in name of the user, allowing him to access APIs on behalf of the user. And what's worse, the attacker also received a refresh token, so the attacker can now use that refresh token with long-term access. However, the front-end doesn't know that this happened. The front-end is fully unaware of this attack, so the front-end is basically going to use that refresh token at some point in time. And when that happens, the authorization server will detect that. The authorization server will be like, hold on. I saw this refresh token before. Why are you using it a second time? That makes zero sense. And the security, to, uh, the, the authorization server will see that as a violation, and it will revoke the entire refresh token chain. So it will revo it will not issue a new token. It will revoke the refresh token tree that was issued to the attacker to ensure that the attacker no longer has access to that token chain and to the API on behalf of the user. And that's refresh token rotation. That's essentially how that works. And that is mandatory according to OAuth 2.0 best practices and OAuth 2.1 for bearer refresh tokens. You can also have sender constraint refresh tokens, which are basically refresh tokens that require permissions to execute certain, um, require permissions, require authentication to exchange them for tokens, which is used by backend web applications. All right, awesome. Uh, question time in a room like this is like shouting really hard and hoping I hear that. Um, it it kind of worked out. I kind of understood the question. So the question was, do refresh tokens have the same lifetime of access tokens or different lifetimes? They, whatever you want, basically. As in, they can have different lifetimes. Usually a refresh token is alive for longer 
So in a front-end web app, what would typically happen is you would have an access token with like five to 10 minutes lifetime and a refresh token with something like eight to 12 hours, uh, which kind of mimics a session of the user. That is something that is not uncommon. But you're fully in control. You can decide how that works in practice. All right. If you have other questions, it's probably easier to grab me after the talk to discuss that um, or run up front and whisper it in my ear. That's also a good option. Shouting is maybe successful. I don't know. We can try it again, but I'm not sure if it's going to succeed another time. Refresh token rotation. This is where things get challenging. Because the idea behind refresh rota ro token rotation is that the attacker breaks into the app, executes malicious JavaScript, steals a refresh token, and, and basically uses that refresh token uh, to obtain tokens. And that perception of JavaScript, that perception of malicious JavaScript, of a cross-site scripting attack in the front end, is somewhat mistaken. Because it's, it relies on the fact that the attacker is basically a script kitty that doesn't really know what they're doing. It's like, <gasps> I'm able to access tokens, mostly likely in local storage. I'm extracting those tokens and abusing them immediately. And that is a simplistic, not so realistic attack. So how does that work? Well, you execute that attack, meaning you as the attacker, for example, you write a review and you add a snippet of JavaScript code. And if you visit that application with that review, that code executes in your browser. So if it's my code, if I'm the attacker, I can now execute that code in your browser. I can steal your refresh token, send it to a server that I control. That's me at the bottom. And once I get that refresh token, I can use it. And now I have tokens in your name so I can access the API. That is the scenario that refresh token rotation tries to protect against. Also works with access tokens, by the way. I can steal access tokens and refresh tokens and abuse both of them. How would you do that? An attack like this is super straightforward. It looks like this. You load an image. In that image, you drop all the data in the URL. You drop all the data from local storage. And you load it from an evil server. Malicious food, that's my evil server. I like food, sorry about that. And we send it off to there, and we can abuse it. This is the attack scenario that refresh token rotation addresses. And in essence, that's why we have short-lived access tokens, because if you steal an access token, you can only abuse it for 5 to 10 minutes. Good. And if you steal a refresh token and you use that, well, refresh token rotation, the authorization server will detect that and will revoke tokens so the attack is stopped. And that's the whole idea behind these security mechanisms, and that idea is completely flawed. It doesn't work, because this is a very simplistic, silly attack. It's not what a real attacker would do. Script kiddies are not your threat model. Yes, it's good to keep them out and to protect your applications against script kiddies, but the real attackers will not be stopped by these security mechanisms. Two scenarios where this doesn't work very well. One is a slightly more sophisticated attack. Instead of just stealing the token and using it, what if we only use it at a convenient time? And it works like this. So we execute our attack, as in I create a review with a malicious JavaScript. It loads in your browser. And I, the first thing I do in malicious code is instead of just stealing the data, I send, uh, set up a heartbeat. Like every 10 seconds, I'm going to call my own server. Like, hey, this browser is still online. Hey, this browser is online. Every 10 seconds, like, here I am, here I am, here I am. All right, step one. Step two is I'm going to steal your refresh tokens. Every time you get a new refresh token, I'm going to take it and ship it off to my server, just collecting it. Like here is that latest refresh token, RT1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to 17 or whatever, until the heartbeat dies, until the heartbeat is no longer there. Well, I'm going to wait. And if it's not there 10 seconds later, and 10 seconds later, guess what? You are now offline. You have closed the tab in your browser, you have shut down your laptop, you have lost Wi-Fi connectivity, I don't care what you did, but the app is no longer online. That's essentially step five. We detected the heartbeat has died. And guess what your app is not going to do when it's offline? Well, you don't have to guess because I can't hear you anyway. <laughs> There's a lot of noise back here from downstairs as well. But guess what the app is not going to do? Use the latest refresh token. Because it's not online anymore. So the attacker is now excellent. All right, the latest one was RT17. Perfect. I'm going to use RT17 with the authorization server. I will get access token 18 and refresh token 18, and I can now pretend to be Philip. Well, pretend to be you. Um, I can pretend to be you for the next amount of time, which can often be hours until the refresh token chain finally expires. That's essentially a very nasty attack factor that fully 
takes advantage of what refresh token rotation has to offer. It basically sidesteps refresh token rotation and it can't protect against attacks like this. And that is a big problem. And the whole problem with cross-site scripting and malicious JavaScript is that the attacker controls the front-end application. They can do anything that you as a front-end developer would be able to do. And there's one worst thing the attacker can do, and this next scenario is basically not good. It's even worse than sidestepping refresh token rotation. And the next scenario is just getting a new set of tokens. We have the application, app.rescue.com, doing its thing, and you know what front-end applications do when you load them the first time? They don't have any state. Because modern, API, modern SDKs for front-ends, they don't store stuff in local storage. They hide tokens as good as they can to prevent them from being stolen by a malicious attacker, by an attacker running JavaScript. So they hide tokens in God knows what places, like web workers. Good example, a web worker. You hide a refresh token in a web worker and you can't access that. And that's true. There's no straightforward way or there's no way to access the data in the web worker. Awesome. Good. But the attacker here is smart. And what does the app do when you first bootstrap it? It doesn't have a worker, it doesn't have state. So it's going to run a hidden iframe-based flow, like it's going to load an iframe, hide that frame in the browser, run a silent flow, which will use your existing session with the authorization server if you have one. That's why you load the app, and it's unauthenticated, and then like a second later, floop, it's like, welcome, Philippe. That means the app has run that flow in the background. It's like, oh, there's a cookie. Oh, yeah, this, the authorization server knows that it's Philip from 10 minutes ago. Awesome. It's going to automatically issue a code, which is exchanged for tokens. And floop, you are now authenticated. Single sign-on at work. And a lot of SDKs do this by default, by the way. The Out0 SDK, if you just include it for Angular or React or Vue, the first thing it does is like, let's see if there's a session and tokens. Bam, bam. Done. Awesome. Good, the app does what it does, we don't care about that. We're the attacker now. What do we as the attacker do? Well, we're going to abuse the fact that there's no authentication in this flow. The entire security of this flow relies on that redirect URI. Like, we only send the code to app.restrogate.com and nowhere else. But guess what? We as the attacker control. If I have that malicious JavaScript in your browser, I control app.restrogate.com. My code runs in that specific origin and I can do whatever I want within app.restaway.com in your browser. So what am I going to do? I'm going to run that same pattern. I'm going to load a hidden iframe. In that iframe, I'm going to bootstrap a hidden, a silent authorization code flow, which will send a request to that authorization server from your browser, and it will include your cookie. Either your cookie was still there from before, or it's there because you authenticated the app. Your browser has a cookie for the authorization server, and the authorization server will know who you are. It's like, oh, you want a new set of tokens? Like, sure. It doesn't know that this is malicious JavaScript code. For all it knows, it, you open a new tab and went to restrogate.com again, and it's just a new instantiation of the app. There's no difference. Once we get the authorization code, we can send it to the attacker's controlled resource. We can exchange that code for tokens, and that's a fresh set of tokens now. It's a set of tokens that is unrelated to the legitimate application's tokens, and it's completely new and fully in control of the attacker now. And that's not good, because the attacker can now exchange that code for tokens, access token, refresh token, valid for 8 to 12 hours, and we now have access in name of the user for 8 to 12 hours. And that is a massive problem. And every front-end security scenario that relies on trying to hide tokens from the attacker is vulnerable to attacks like this. There's no good way to protect against this, because this is inherent to the security model of front-end web applications. The moment you control that, you control it all, and you can do whatever you want. So I have a question, if you're a front-end developer, so are you screwed? Well, the answer is kind of yes, in case you're wondering. Like, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> all right. If I would end, I end here, this would be kind of depressing. It's like, ha, ah, this is all messed up in all kinds of ways. Good luck with that. Bye-bye. Um, well, there is a solution. And the solution is actually what, what a lot of high, highly sensitive applications are doing. And the solution is don't build front-end web applications, which is not very helpful, right? So the solution is not don't build them. The solution is build them, but move the OAuth component to a backend for front-end pattern. That's what you're supposed to do. And that's a backend for front-end. And here's the conceptual idea. So instead of the front-end here, which is direct in, uh, directly interacting with the authorization server and with the API, we're going to put a backend component, a BFF, in front of that. 
and your front end and your BFF together, that's your application. That's essentially the front end. And for the rest, nothing changes. So all you do is basically you add that BFF becomes the OAuth client application. So you move the OAuth features from the front end into the BFF, and you keep track of that with a cookie. That's it. Just like that. And what, uh, what does that mean? It means that the BFF becomes the OAuth client, which is interacting with the authorization server. And guess what a backend web application does when it interacts with the authorization server? It authenticates client credentials. Whether it's secret-based or key-based, doesn't matter. It authenticates whenever it uses tokens. And how does the front-end call an API? Well, it just calls an endpoint on the BFF, slash BFF, slash reviews. And the BFF will see that request, and it's like, oh, you want to call an API endpoint? Awesome. I'm going to take your cookie. I'm going to retrieve your tokens as a user. So if you make that request to me as the BFF, I'm going to take your cookie, retrieve your access token, slap your access token on the request, and send it to the actual API. And the API hasn't changed. The API is still your API from before. It gets the request with an access token. It uses the access token to make authorization decisions and gives you a response. And the response goes back to the front end. That's the concept of a BFF. And the BFF here is nothing more than a glorified proxy, which is very disrespectful to BFFs, but it's the truth. It's a glorified proxy that just forwards calls. It has no business logic, no authorization information, no API-specific information. It just knows, here's a cookie. I can use that cookie to get to tokens, slap tokens on a request, and forward them, and send a response back. That's what a BFF really does in practice. You can build that BFF in a stateful way or a stateless way, whatever you want. You can put tokens in a cookie, encrypt that cookie, and send it to the browser. That would be a secure way of implementing that in practice. What's the benefit here? Well, the benefit is, even if the attacker compromises this, it can't, the attacker can't exchange a code here for tokens. There's no silent flows to execute, because all of the flows that you would execute require client authentication on the code exchange, client authentication on a refresh token exchange, making the whole security uh, approach a lot better. So the BFF allows you to follow best practices for backend web applications, makes it easier to use things like sender constraint tokens backed by MTLS, would be easy to implement on a BFF, would be a nightmare in frontends or virtually impossible in web-based frontends. And I can hear you thinking like, yeah, but does that really solve cross-site scripting? No, it doesn't. But it solves the consequences of cross-site scripting. Well, not really. It, it reduces the impact of the attack, let's call it that. Because cross-site scripting is always possible. And my first advice when we talk about this is fix your damn cross-site scripting problems, because that's a real major issue in a web app. Get that right. On my website, I have a lot of advice on do that, doing that for React and Angular, by the way. So look at that. But the benefit here is the BFF never exposes tokens to an attacker. There's no way for the attacker to obtain tokens from the front end alone. And the only thing the attacker can do is ask the BFF to send a request, meaning that the BFF can re choose which endpoints to expose. It's not full raw API access. It's limited through what the BFF exposes to the front end. And second, your BFF could implement some normal, sensible rules on what you're supposed to do as a front end. If your front end requests like sends 10, requ 10 requests per minute in normal cases, well, guess what? If it sends 10,000 in a minute, you might want to be at the BFF level like me. You've had enough for now. What the hell is wrong with you? That can definitely work as well. So this gives you the power to control, and this actually uh, makes the whole scenario a hell of a lot better. So that's actually how things are improving. So BFFs rely on core building blocks. They're nothing special. What they basically do is they have the use of cookies, they use a backend OAuth client library, and that's it. Again, a glorified proxy. If you're familiar with uh, Duende Identity Server, they have a library, a BFF library, that implements that whole BFF concept for you. And if you're not familiar, there's also a package from Manfred Steyer that has an, an, a reverse proxy that does something very similar. So you'll find existing implementations of BFFs, and building that yourself is not going to be a month worth of work. It's going to be a day, two days, and that's it. Then you have a fully tested, fully configurable BFF you can use across all your applications. Awesome. And they can be stateful, stateless, depending on what you prefer as an implementation pattern. Good. What's the takeaway here? The takeaway is that OAuth 2.x, uh, because it's, it's an ongoing problem, uh, underestimates the power of malicious JavaScript. 
as in the security measures in OAuth will not protect you against full compromise if you have a cross site scripting vulnerability. Be aware of that because that is a very big limitation of these specs. In the industry, a best practice for security sensitive applications is to use BFFs instead of plain front ends that have their own client ID. The BFF is the OAuth client. And this, for example, very relevant here, is used in your Norwegian healthcare system. Like I know the people uh, responsible for building that from Udelt, they, they were at the conference as well, they probably still are, and they know about these problems and they say like, yeah, screw front ends. No freaking way that you can have a front end as a legitimate client. We only allow back end clients or mobile apps, if I'm not mistaken, but I'm not exactly sure, and we enforce the use of a BFF for front ends. All right. Yes, light again, awesome. The dark slides hide you, and then a light slide, you're like, oh, my eyes. But uh, sorry about that. <laughs> Usually, it's not that dark in the audience. So wh what else is there beyond OI 2.1? Like, what else um, is there to look at? Like I said in the beginning, OI 2.1 can't incorporate everything that they would have wanted, uh, because otherwise, it's going to be a nightmare to get to supporting OI 2.1. If you're like, yeah, your OAuth stuff, 2.0, plus these five additional things, you're going to be like, yeah, screw it. I will stay on OAuth 2.0 for a while. Twitter is still on OAuth, OAuth 1, uh, for example. So yeah, that happens in practice. So they said like OAuth 2.1 is simple, straightforward. If you're doing OAuth 2.0 right, you are doing OAuth 2.1. Get there today. That's something I can highly recommend. Get this thing, these things sorted out. Make sure you do that correctly. And then if you want more, there's more security conscious configurations of OAuth where you have things like JAR, uh, where you have the authorization, the initialization URI with all the parameters. That's now a JSON web token. Uh, you can push that to the authorization server before sending it. That's PAR, pushed authorization requests. You have RAR for rich authorization requests where you can ask like fine-grained consent from the user. Um, for, for example, for financial transactions, you can ask consent for a single transaction with all the parameters. That's RAR. And then FAPI2 is for the fortified APIs, highly security sensitive uh, configurations on what to do right, for example, for financial APIs or healthcare APIs. Just a couple of references. Uh, you can dig into these yourself if you're interested in going beyond the current best practices and improving the security of your deployment. All right, brings us to three important key takeaways. Number one, you should probably be able to say this uh, together with me, but number one, if you use OAuth 2.0 the right way, which you should, you're already doing OAuth 2.1. That should be a relief. It's like, oh, awesome. If you're not, look into improving that. Because these things are really, really important. Things like Pixie are important. So make sure you start using that as soon as you can. User applications, instead of having all of these different flows, it's like the authorization code flow with Pixie, and that's it. Front-end web app, mobile web app, back-end web app, all the same flow. Makes my life as a teacher a lot easier because I don't have to explain all of these different flows with different trade-offs and so on. And a lot of these things translate into OIDC as well. Maybe not officially, but in practice, an OIDC flow will support something like Pixie if the authorization server does that. Awesome. And then. Third, security-sensitive front-end web apps, they can't stand on their own in an OAuth ecosystem. You really, really have to look into that BFF pattern. It's the only proper way to make sure you can protect your applications in the front-end. And those are the three most important takeaways. If some of these things are like Chinese or, I don't know, if you're in a region, Dutch to you, whatever, a language you don't really understand, which for me is a lot of languages, Starts with French, which Belgian people don't like if you don't speak French, but sure. Um, I have a course on OAuth. Uh, it's about OAuth 2.0, but I cover a lot of best practices, so you can scratch it out and write 2.1. It's going to be uh, sort of similar, so check it out if you want to. Thank you mu very much for being here. Um, I'm going to stick around after the session so you can ask me questions if you have any. Um, we're not going to do it live because it's going to be a nightmare with the, the height and the shouting and the noise and stuff like that, so ask me afterwards. And connect with me on social media if you want to stay in touch and stay up to date on security. Thank you very much.